Hello and welcome. Last time we saw that if we have a linear system being forced by a sine wave, then the output of that system the transfer function between u and y is g then the output of that system settles into a sine wave of amplitude b frequency that is same as the forcing sine wave which is And we also saw that <coughs> B by A, which is called the amplitude ratio, is a function of omega, the forcing sine wave frequency. And it's given by the magnitude of the complex number G, J omega, S replaced by J omega. And the phase shift is given by angle of the complex number g j omega we also saw a few nyquist plots and body plots and and last time we ended with the notion that if you have a feedback system so i mean let's say yeah so okay so I've got again a uh, controller dynamic element and then I've got GP and this is in a feedback arrangement and uh, we argued that if this loop is broken and can be switched on or off at will then if we find that particular frequency omega c that special frequency omega c for which the phase shift is for which phase shift is equal to minus 180 degrees if we can find that particular frequency then then this is a sine wave then the sine wave that is being fed back or will be fed back is in phase then minus y because this feedback signal is minus y is in phase with y set point which is being varied as a sine wave and I'm just taking the amplitude arbitrarily as one of frequency omega c then if at time t equal to zero I do two things uh, so the other thing that we did was we adjusted kc such that the amplitude of the sine wave such that amp amplitude of minus y sine wave is same as of y set point sine wave then if at a time t equal to 0 I do two things simultaneously I close this wave 
uh, I close the loop and switch off the sine wave the forcing sine wave then as far as the system is concerned this signal even after the change remains unchanged and therefore the closed system will keep oscillating forever now if KC was less than this critical KC that I found for which the sine wave had the same amplitude as the forcing sine wave then the system oscillations will die out if the sine wave is larger than the minus y sine wave is larger than the forcing sine wave then these oscillations will blow up and if it is exactly the same if the amplitude of the minus y sine wave is exactly the same as the forcing y set point sine wave then we'll get sustained oscillation so this brings us to this very fundamental idea by the way phase for of what is minus 180 degree phase of this transfer function the loop transfer function the phase of KC GC GP yeah the phase of this guy is minus 180 degree. that frequency for which the phase of this transfer function is minus 180 degrees that's what we are calling Omega C and well I guess that's that so what we saw last time was that if you have a feedback system where this is G open loop and now I have absorbed the KC and the GC into G open loop if you have a feedback system of this kind then it's like magic if amplitude ratio at omega critical omega critical being defined as omega critical is equal to omega for the frequency at which phase of G open loop is equal to minus 80 deg 180 degrees so if the amplitude ratio at omega critical is equal to 1 we get sustained oscillations if it's greater than 1 then we get oscillations that blow up and if it is less than 1 then we get oscillations that die out that die out or decay and when do these oscillations die out when we stop forcing the y set point sine wave and close the sine uh, the, the feedback loop simultaneously okay so what this means is that the if the amplitude ratio of G open loop at Omega equal to Omega critical is less than 1 at that frequency at which the phase of the open loop system is minus 180 degrees so if amplitude ratio at Omega critical of G open loop is less than 1 at Omega critical then closed loop system is stable this is the Bode stability criterion there is also what we have what we call uh, the Nyquist stability theorem I think it's a theorem or maybe it's a criterion I don't know but a more general version of it which is called the Nyquist stability theorem we'll talk about that in just a little bit 
but the key idea that the amplification that you see depends on and the phase shift that you see depends on the frequency of the forcing function of the of the uh, frequency of the for forcing sine wave and that you can tell about the stability of the closed loop system by simply looking at the amplitude ratio and phase of the open loop system this sounds like magic i mean we are looking at amplitude ratio of g open loop not g closed loop g closed loop is gol by 1 plus gol we are looking at gol only okay so if the amplitude ratio of the open loop system at the critical frequency or at the phase crossover frequency omega omega c is also called as phase cross over frequency so simply by looking at whether the amplitude ratio of the open loop system at the critical frequency or at the phase crossover frequency is greater than 1 equal to 1 or less than 1 we can start saying things with confidence that the closed loop system will be unstable stable or or or, or marginally stable this sounds like magic and actually it is not magic uh, so to explore why this occurs we need to look at uh, the polar plot of uh, g open loop or the nyquist plot so let's 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 look at the polar plot so <coughs> when see the fundamental stability question is whether the characteristic equation of the feedback system is 1 plus g open loop is equal to 0 this is the closed loop characteristic equation if this characteristic equation has roots in the right half plane even one of one root in the right half plane implies that the that this closed loop system is unstable so the key question is does closed loop characteristic equation have any right half plane roots yeah so typically for most systems what we do is you know we take by the way g open loop is a function of s and therefore uh, 1 plus g open loop is a function of s s in general can be a complex number so we have s as the complex number so the s plane and we also have the complex number g open loop which is the g plane or the g open loop plane now if I take a complex number on the S plane it will map to a complex number on the G open loop plane now let us say I take and 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 and, and the general form of G open loop is uh, you know what we saw in root locus S minus ZJ uh, upon S minus PI maybe with a with a multiplier k when this is sort of the and i goes from 1 to n and j goes from 1 to m and m is usually less than n but it cannot be it at most it can be equal to n but not greater than n yeah <coughs> okay uh, now let's see uh, let, let, let's start thinking in general you know I have a so let me plot the poles and zeros of G open loop on the S plane so when S equal to I don't know so let's say it has got poles like this I don't know maybe maybe something like this maybe it's got some zeros in the right half you know you j just just do a pole zero kind of 
you know and g can be any kind of transfer function <coughs> so this is the pole zero map of g in general a general pole zero map now let us say i take a contour i take a clockwise contour closed contour in the s plane so just some let's just take any contour uh and in order to be clear uh let me not plot the so let me take a contour blow it up you know just some some kind of contour there is a closed contour clockwise contour and there are poles and zeros here and there you know uh there's poles and zeros some are here too let us say in this contour and this contour could be in the right half plane part of right half plane left half plane part of left left half plane it's the contour is general uh maybe something over here i don't know yeah just created something very general now as s s is a so this is the s plane and i am taking s to lie on this closed contour as s moves along this contour my mapping g will move along some contour and eventually after moving when i have gone around the loop fully and come back this two would have gone around and come back and maybe it would have gone around like this and come back it doesn't really matter you know bottom line i start from somewhere i reach the same place once i have gone around the contour yeah that's the bottom line so now i start asking the question once i have gone around the contour once g would also go around in a loop and come back to the same point now the question is does g in going around and coming back to the same point as s goes around and returns to the same point does g encircle the origin or not does g encircle origin if so how many times that's the question that we are asking and <coughs> to answer this question uh let's consider a critical point that is outside the contour a pole or a zero and let's consider a critical point that is inside the contour okay so if you look at a critical point that is outside the contour and and I'll take this one because maybe the drawing here will be simpler then this point for this point s minus this particular pole is this vector so s minus that particular pole is this vector it is subtending an angle that's that's over here and now as s moves along the contour this angle you know let us say the s moves and comes here this angle would become negative but then as s starts moving back up this angle starts going this side so ultimately what happens is as you as s moves along the as s are yaar as s moves along the contour and comes back to the same point you will see that this angle what the hell is going on you will see that this angle has gone from here to here and then gone back again so the angle in going around the contour once hasn't changed the angle swept by a pole and by extension by a zero that is outside the closed s contour the angle swept in moving around the s contour once is actually zero so poles or z's zeros outside contour
स्वीप जीरो एंगल एस एस मूव अराउंड कॉन्टूर अराउंड क्लोज कॉन्टूर वंस ओके सो दैट्स पॉइंट नंबर वन नाउ लेट्स लुक एट ए पोल और अ जीरो दैट इज इन साइड द that is inside the contour are yeah, let's clean it up a little bit so let's look at a pole let's look at this guy if i look at this guy the angle at the current s is this this is the angle and as s moves around comes here the angle becomes this and as s goes around and comes back you see the angle swept is actually 2 pi but because the pole occurs in the denominator so the angle swept for a clockwise rotation by the pole will be negative of a clockwise angle so the okay so a pole inside the contour sweeps because clockwise angles are by definition negative and poles are occurring in the denominator so negative of negative would be positive sweeps plus 2 pi that means anti clockwise sweeps plus 2 pi angle hang on hang on hang on plus 2 pi angle in the g plane as as s moves around the contour once if it was a zero if it was a zero the angle swept would be minus 2 pi Minus two pi is. That means in the G plane, if there is a zero that is inside the contour, then in the G plane, as S moves along the closed contour, G would move along a closed contour. That closed contour will encircle. If there is one zero inside that contour in the S plane, then in the G plane, you would encircle the origin once. If there is one zero inside. if there are two zeros you encircle the origin twice so let us say you're starting from here and you're going along the closed contour or you let's say you're starting from here going along the closed closed contour uh, you'll actually one encirclement would be for example one encircle would be for example this this would be one encirclement there could be two encirclements uh here we it has to be symmetric about the imaginary axis so i don't know so this is one encirclement and this is two encirclements yeah so that's two encirclements we're going this way so these are two clockwise encirclements so for every pole that is inside the contour in the s plane you will get one anti clockwise encirclement for every zero that is inside the closed contour you will get one clockwise encirclement and therefore number of 
we'll just say clockwise encirclements of the origin in the G plane in the polar plot of G is going to be equal to number of zeros minus number of poles in inside closed contour of S. Okay, so now for a control system we are interested in finding out how many close how many roots of this chap by the way roots of this chap are the zeros of this guy not the poles how many roots of this chap are in the right half plane so we will therefore take a contour that encircles the entire right half plane in the S plane we'll take a contour that goes uh, like this you know start from here go to plus infinity then go around in a semicircle semi infinite circle so this is a cont you know and then come back to the origin so this is a closed contour that encircles the en that 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 contains the entire right half plane so I'll take a contour that goes like this and the magic comes you see the magic comes because of the following I want to find out how many roots of this equation are in the right half plane so I take the S plane I take a closed contour that goes like this which encircles the entire right half plane yeah and what I can do is I can calculate the complex number G open loop add one to it and then look for encirclements of origin alternatively I can take the complex number G open loop not add one to it and then look for encirclements of you know in the G plane look for encirclements of this guy so this is just a shift of the origin from 0 0 to minus 1 0 yeah and therefore the magic happens I make the polar plot of G open loop and most of the time what happens is because M is usually greater than N therefore when you take for example just take 1 over some tau s plus 1 where the difference in the degrees is 1 M and N is 1 this guy when you are going if you when you're going around s in the semicircle so that so s would be uh, along the semicircle it would be s would be equal to r e to the power j theta and theta going from plus pi by 2 to minus pi by 2 that's the that's the semicircle right so if you take s equal to this and substitute uh, let us say into this guy then what will happen is you will get 1 over tau r e to the power j theta plus 1 and as r tends to infinity magnitude of g tends to 0 so therefore when you are going along the semicircle most or all practical G open loop transfer functions map to the origin 
because the magnitude is zero in the G plane. Yeah, uh, this will become clearer when we do an example. But so the idea is, I take a contour in the S plane. This is the S plane, and move from the origin to plus infinity along the imaginary axis. Then move along the semicircle, semi-infinite semicircle, and then move from uh, s equal to minus infinity, minus j infinity to zero along the negative uh, negative imaginary axis. In this way, I end up encircling the entire right half plane, and thus, now if I apply my understanding of contours. Number of clockwise encirclements of zero by G open loop. A number of clockwise encirclements of not zero minus one zero because I did the shift of origin. Encirclements, encirclements of minus by G open loop is equal to number of roots of one plus G open loop. Minus number. This, this, these roots are zeros of G open loop. Minus number of poles. Number of poles of G open loop of actually one plus G open loop. But then you will see that if you look at one plus g open loop, it will be one plus a numerator polynomial by a denominator polynomial. So that's going to be ds plus ns divided by ds equal to zero. No, not equal to zero. So that we are looking for yeah. So the poles of this guy one plus g open loop are the Zeros of the denominator, which are the poles of G open loop itself, because G open loop is equal to n by d, n by n s by d s. Yeah, so the poles of G open loop and one plus G open loop both are the same. The zeros are different because you get this. So instead of saying one plus G open loop, I can also say this guy. So number of clockwise encirclements of minus one zero by G open loop is equal to number of roots of the closed loop characteristic equation minus the number of poles of G open loop in the right half plane. Because my closed contour is encircling in right half plane, the entire right half plane. Now, if my G open loop is stable. If G open loop is stable, then this goes to zero for G open loop stable, and then the number of encirclements of minus one zero is equal to the number of roots of the closed loop characteristic equation in the right half plane. So for most systems, it boils down to if G open loop is stable, then number of clockwise encirclements of minus one zero by G open loop is equal to number of closed loop characteristic equation roots in right half plane but the most general form of the 
Nyquist criterion is this guy because you could have open loop unstable systems that already have a pole in the right half plane in which case you will have to account for the extra and the anti clockwise encirclements caused by any poles of G open loop that are in the right half plane one may have to account for that but most commonly for 90% or 95% of the system this works just fine so now let's just start thinking of applying this uh, stability criterion we have already looked at some Nyquist plots by the way by the way when I go from here to here and I plot G open loop that's equal to substituting S in G open loop substituting S is equal to G omega so you see G open loop with S equal to J omega do you see that this is nothing but the Nyquist plot of G open loop Nyquist plot of G open loop so when I go from here to here I get the Nyquist plot of G open loop when I go from here to here I remain at the origin because like I discussed uh, as R tends to infinity uh, because the order of the denominator is greater than the order of the numerator uh, therefore you map to the or you remain at the origin and then when I go from here to here that's G minus J omega omega going from infinity to 0 uh, do you see that what I obtain here I'll obtain the complex conjugate of that as I go from here to here so for example for a first order system you know uh, 1 by tau s plus 1 uh, we saw last time the, the Nyquist plot looks like this that means when I go from here to here in the G plane I go from here to here when I go from here to here in the S plane I go from here to here in the G plane okay then when I go from here to here I remain at the origin and then when I go from here to here uh, you know you see the entire polar plot as as s moves along the entire contour yeah would be like this but it is understood that uh, when you do the Nyquist plot that you will have a complex conjugate complementary branch or a complementary part uh, but we don't draw it it is understood that it is there yeah so now let us just just start looking at some some simple things that come out of the Nyquist stability criterion so let's say I've got a first order system first order system what kind of a Nyquist plot do I have first order system Nyquist plot is like this something like that and if I draw the entire complementary part which I don't have to but if I draw, draw it at least in the beginning so that things are clear does this encircle the origin or does this encircle the point minus one zero no if I increase KC the curve will become larger but it will still not encircle the critical point minus one zero yeah so therefore this implies first order system will never go unstable never goes unstable uh, the gain is KC so it's a proportional controller okay let's look at a sec second order controller under proportional control second order system will like we saw like yesterday it will have a something like that the critical point is minus one zero its uh, complementary part as s goes along minus j omega is going to be something like this but we don't usually draw it no matter what you do you can increase the gain as much as you want 
if you increase the gain maybe you'll get something like this yeah but you will never encircle minus 1 0 so second order system under p control yeah by the way this is under p control second order system under p control never goes unstable and this is consist consistent with our root locus knowledge if you got a first order system uh, the open loop root is here you'll get one asymptote that's this guy you'll never go unstable second order system root locus you got two roots in the left half plane root locus would look something like this yeah you do get oscillations but you never go unstable now let's look at a, a third order system for a third order system the Nyquist plot would look something like this and the complementary part would be like this okay now if this is my point minus one zero if I increase the gain sufficiently I will get a situation where the Nyquist plot is like this so that's one encirclement because I have gone around minus one once and then the complementary part that's another encirclement because I've gone around the minus one zero another time and these encirclements are clockwise in nature therefore if the gain is sufficiently large what this is telling us is there are two roots of the characteristic equation of the closed loop system that are in the right half plane for sufficiently large gain and this is consistent with our root locus understanding if you got three mm, poles one of one of them ends up in an asymptote like this then you get a break point and you know you, you get your root locus something like that these asymptotes are at 60 degrees and minus 60 degrees so two roots move into the right half plane two complex conjugate a complex conjugate pair moves into the right half plane so you get two encirclements of the uh, critical point minus one zero yeah when the two roots are on the verge of moving into the right half plane then what is the situation then your Nyquist plot would look something like this you know it will just pass through the critical point it will uh, my drawing is not very good which is why I used to use PowerPoint but we don't have the luxury of uh, it doesn't matter so it will just pass through minus one zero this corresponds to roots about to move on to the with purely imaginary parts yeah so this how far you are away from minus one zero the critical point and the point minus one zero in the G plane in the G open loop plane this point minus one zero it has a phase of minus 180 degrees and it has a magnitude of one therefore the Bode criterion the Bode criterion states that if your G open loop amplitude ratio is more than one that means G open loop when the phase is minus 180 degrees is so what, what that then means is you are actually encircling minus one zero and therefore you end up being unstable so I hope things are clear where does the magic come from how can you tell from G open loop how many roots are in the right half plane well that's by just shifting the origin from zero zero to minus one zero and then you're looking at the roots of one plus G open loop in the right half plane and that's where the magic comes from okay uh, this point minus one zero I need to make sure that the polar plot of G open loop is sufficiently away from minus one zero because the closer I get to minus one zero the closer I get to instability that's the basic idea so 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 the idea is tune controller
such that G open loop Nyquist plot or polar plot remains sufficiently away from the critical point minus 1 0 yeah now there are two very common metrics that are employed one is called gain margin and the other is called phase margin Gain margin is easy to see. So I have a polar plot of G. This is the critical point. Uh, let's say the polar plot passes through. So clearly I am not encircling minus 1 0. I am stable. So now what we say is I want the amplitude ratio at the critical the crossover frequency when the phase is minus 10 uh, minus 180 180 degrees i want the amplitude ratio at omega crossover or at the phase crossover frequency where the phase becomes minus 180 degrees at that frequency to be sufficiently away from one and that margin is called gain margin so if i take a gain margin of 2 example if gain margin is taken equal to 2, what then this implies is that Kc has been chosen. You see, when I increase or decrease Kc, my polar plot expands or shrinks. So, Kc chosen such that this point is minus half. So, if I increase Kc by a factor of 2, that's the gain margin, that's why we call gain margin 2. If I increase Kc by a factor of 2, then my polar plot will just pass through minus 1, 0 and my system would be exhibiting sustained oscillations. So, this is the idea behind gain margin. So, so the construction is, the gain margin construction is, if gain margin is taken as let us say 3, uh, then Nyquist pa plot passes through minus 1 by gain margin. So, you force the Nyquist plot, you adjust Kc such that Nyquist plot passes through the point minus 1 by Gm 0. That is the idea behind gain margin tuning. Uh, phase margin phase margin is uh, it's not tricky now instead of looking at gain or 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 the amplitude ratio when the frequency or when the when the phase is minus 180 degrees we look at that point that frequency for which the amplitude or the, or the amplitude ratio is 1 and if the amplitude ratio is 1 what is the phase and if that phase is sufficiently away from minus 180 degrees so let us say if the phase is minus 135 degrees that means you have 45 degrees further to go before the phase becomes minus 180 degrees right so you've got a phase margin of 45 degrees so here is the idea the idea is as follows you have some nyquist plot okay uh, i don't know uh, the other side is not important the critical point is here or oh, yeah, no i didn't draw it very very well uh, maybe i'll draw it again so uh, just clean up everything on this slide 
so i mean the other part is not so important so we'll not how does the uh, nyquist plot look at on, at the other parts that, that's not really important so i have a you know a unit circle minus 1 yeah unit circle bhi humse dhang se nahi banta my drawing is so shitty so forgive me for oh lord forgive me for i have sinned huh okay so uh, let's let's draw a unit circle let's draw a circle first huh and then we'll say ha bhaiya ye minus 1 hai ye minus 1 hai ye 1 hai ye 1 hai and let's say i have a nyquist plot that's coming like this a nyquist plot that's coming like this oh, what else is happening over there is not really important then this is the frequency or this is the point where the amplitude becomes 1 amplitude of g becomes 1 and the angle or the phase is this guy for the phase to be minus 180 degrees i still have this much margin so this is called phase margin so i hope this is clear uh, to clarify uh, uh, we will there is one property by the way if you look at the equation for phase phase is independent of kc so when you change kc the log modulus increases or decreases depending on whether you are increasing kc or decreasing kc but changing kc does not change the phase at all on the other hand when you are changing tau i tau d the phase changes and also uh, the log modulus changes yeah so kc is something that doesn't affect the phase and so the design becomes very easy so if i am saying i want a phase margin of let us say i don't know 45 degrees then what that means is i am looking for that particular frequency at which what is the frequency at which the phase is 180 degrees minus 45 taken the taken the minus sign out huh okay so well that's that then this guy is phase margin what is the frequency at which the phase is this that frequency can be calculated from angle of gj omega should be equal to phi Minus one eight. Uh, yeah. So 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 that's that. Okay. Um, let me just do an example, and things will become clear rather than bluffing so much. So let's take a very simple system. The 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 beauty of uh, frequency domain techniques is that it can handle systems with dead time. So let's take a system with dead time. Very simple. First order plus dead time system. So let's take GP is equal to two times. gain is 2 e to the power minus s divided by 5s plus 1 okay so then we are controlling it using a proportional only controller so gc is equal to kc and therefore the loop transfer function is actually 2 times kc into e to the power minus s divided by 5s plus 1 and then we say okay if i replace g o s with j omega you open loop in terms of s then what i get is 2 times kc into e to the power minus j omega divided by 5 times omega j 
plus 1 angle of G is actually gain doesn't affect the angle so angle is actually minus Omega minus because occurs in the denominator minus tan inverse phi omega okay so that's the angle let us say I want to tune find KC for a gain margin of 2 typical gain margin ranges are 2 to 3 for, hmm? find KC for a gain margin of 2 if I want to tune in this way then what do I do I find the frequency at which the angle becomes minus 180 degrees so minus Omega crossover minus tan inverse Omega crossover this should be equal to minus 180 degrees this is a nonlinear equation you can solve it iteratively for Omega C it turns out that omega c is equal to 1.69 radians per minute I will just take time units as minute by default and not seconds as in electrical systems electrical systems are very fast mechanical systems are very fast chemical systems take it easy slow and easy yeah okay so that's omega critical at this omega critical value I would like that the magnitude of G open loop J omega at omega critical must be equal to 1 by gain margin and gain margin has been taken as 2 so must be equal to half so now magnitude of G open loop is actually 2 kc e to the power minus j omega magnitude is 1 divided by square root 25 omega square but omega is equal to omega c so this should be equal to 1 by 2 so this gives kc is equal to square root 25 omega c square plus 1 divided by 4 just substitute the value of omega c in there and what you get then is KC gain KC is equal to 2 point I think 2 5 eh? 2 point 2 point 1 2 2 point actually it's 2 point 1 2 3 something like that okay so this is the KC that gives me a gain margin of if I want to do phase margin tuning so let us say uh, we say okay uh, want a phase margin of 45 degrees typical phase margin ranges that you tune for is 30 degrees to maybe 50 degrees so let's take uh, we want a phase margin what is the KC such that you get a phase margin of 45 degrees so what that remember phase margin is independent phase is independent of KC so what we will do is we'll calculate the frequency at which the phase is the phase is and uh, so that's actually minus 135 degrees which is actually 3 pi by 4 minus phase should be minus 3 pi by 4 in radians yeah so so minus 3 pi by 4 is what I want the phase to be so now I again do that calculation what is that frequency at which angle of G becomes minus 3 pi by 4 minus uh, tan inverse 5 Omega star this should be equal to minus 3 pi by 4 again you can solve iteratively for Omega and what you get then is Omega star is equal to I did the calculation what does it turn out to be 
uh, 0.9856 so about 0.99 radians per minute and now we are saying that at this frequency magnitude of g open loop j omega at omega equal to omega star must be equal to 1 this implies that 2 times kc times 1 divided by square root of 25 omega star whole square plus 1 should be equal to 1 which implies kc should be equal to square root 25 omega star square plus 1 divided by 2 and this implies that kc for a foil margin of 45 degrees turns out to be 2.51 so phase margin tuning in this case turns out to be a bit aggressive gain margin tuning turns out to be a bit conservative but that is how you end up tuning for gain given gain margin or a given phase margin uh, since we are talking about Nyquist plot and this and that um, Maybe I should also give you a, 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 an example where the Nyquist theorem in its full form needs to be in, invoked because the open loop system is unstable. Maybe I should do that for you. Okay, we'll do that. Uh, that will be the next example. But uh, related to this example, uh, please note that the Nyquist plot is actually like this. Multiple revolutions around the origin and that multiple revolutions is occurring because of the dead time e to the power minus theta s that gives you multiple revolutions but then the magnitude is becoming smaller and smaller and smaller and therefore the Nyquist plot looks like that and what we have done in the tuning is when Kc has been chosen as previously in the previous slide to be 2.123 then this Nyquist plot passes exactly through minus half zero <coughs> and when we did the phase margin tuning then the Nyquist plot passed through this point exactly so you get a slightly bigger something like that so this is gain margin tuning, this is phase margin tuning where this angle is phase margin, 45 degrees. Okay, so this is what I've done and this kind of thinking can be applied to, you know, maybe I'll do just one more simple example. Uh, remember we have, we've been doing this 1 by S plus 1 whole, so let's say GP is equal to 1 over s plus 1 whole cube p controller so kc gc is equal to kc and then we say okay so gc is equal to kc and therefore g open loop is equal to kc over s plus 1 whole cube and this therefore g open loop s equal to j omega substituting s equal to j omega is actually this guy and uh, let us say I want to do gain margin 2 tuning or let us say I want to find out the gain at which you go at the verge of instability so, so, so in that case gain margin is 1 that means you are at the verge of instability that means you want you want the Nyquist plot to pass through minus 1 0 <coughs> okay so angle of G is equal to 3 times minus 3 times tan inverse omega uh, I want this at the critical frequency minus 3 times tan inverse omega should be equal to minus 180 degrees and therefore tan inverse omega 
should be 60 degrees and therefore omega is equal to what square root 3 radians per minute mm, yeah yeah so omega is square root 3 radians per minute and what is the kc corresponding oh, well this is omega critical where the phase becomes so omega critical is square root 3 radians per minute um, what is the kc that makes uh, the nyquist plot pass through that that we can get by saying that magnitude of g open loop j omega at omega critical must be equal to 1 which implies that kc over ah uh, man Oh, omega square plus 1 is the magnitude of 1 and you got to raise this to the power 3 should be equal to 1 which implies Kc is equal to omega square plus 1 to the power 3 by 2 that's it mm, that's it and omega is uh, so 3 plus 1 so so 3 plus 1 3 plus 1 4 4 to the power 3 is 64 square root is 8 so kc so at a kc of 8 you get sustained oscillations this is the ultimate gain i would like to clarify that any system feedback system with negative feedback real system if you have uh, if you crank up the gain you are ultimately en end up going unstable whether you're using pi controller pid controller or p controller but ultimate gain for the purposes of tuning for example ziegler nichols or cohen kuhn or tyrus leiben that ultimate gain refers to the the gain of a p only controller that results in sustained oscillations and the ultimate period is the period of those sustained oscillations which you get when you have a p controller at its ultimate gain you have a p controller which causes the system to end up in sustained oscillations okay so so this is the ultimate gain because we are using a p controller in a similar manner you can handle pi pid controller but the tuning of uh, PI, PID controllers will take up in the maybe the next lecture right now right now what I wanted to show you was a system with uh, so let's take a system which has got a right half plane pole and just to keep the math simple um, we will say that GP is equal to 1 over S minus 1 so that that's a right half plane pole and then a very fast 1 by 10 s plus 1 uh, maybe we'll do a square there okay so this is this is an unstable system controller is a p controller so g open loop is going to be So this is what G open loop is going to be and uh, G open loop J omega is going to be KC divided by J omega minus 1 times omega by 10 J plus 1 whole square. Now let's look at the angle of G open loop the angle is going to be uh, minus 2 times tan inverse omega by 10 so that's pretty straightforward what about this guy if I look at this guy <coughs> in the denominator in so let's look at J omega minus 1 so J omega minus 1 is real part is minus 1 and then you got so this so 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 the angle is 
actually this guy of j omega minus 1 but when you put it in the denominator not worrying about the magnitude the angle would be negative of that so this is what would be the angle of 1 over j omega minus 1 you know and this angle is going to be it's clockwise so minus pi plus okay so minus pi plus tan inverse omega that's what this is going to be so angle of geo open loop is actually minus pi plus tan inverse omega minus 2 tan inverse omega by 10 uh, magnitude yeah we can look at the magnitude that's not really interesting but you see look at this angle when omega is 0 the angle is minus pi when omega is infinity uh, this creates plus 90 and this cre creates um, minus 180 uh, so angle is minus 270 degrees so when omega tends to 0 angle of G is equal to minus 180 degrees when omega tends to infinity angle of G goes to minus 270 degrees uh, magnitude of G tends to 0 so you approach the origin along the minus 270 degree angle yeah uh, if I look at this more carefully see I let, 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 let's now qualitatively shape the Nyquist plot I start from here so that's kc with a negative sign and then as omega is increased you see this angle because you're dividing by 10 won't increase as much as this angle so you'll actually end up uh, this term for small omega will actually end up making a positive contribution will be net positive so minus pi plus a net positive number you'll actually end up going up okay So you end up going up but then this is two times so there will come a stage where this term starts to dominate and you know reduces where where this term starts making a net negative contribution so net negative means minus pi minus something so you will go below the real axis so so basically you end up with a I think something like this I don't really know about the the magnitude but but the shape is going to be s s shaped something like that uh, let's just take some particular shape psi galat really doesn't matter something like this okay this is what qualitatively the Nyquist plot is going to look like and you are approaching the origin at minus 270 degrees as you can see the complementary part of that Nyquist plot is going to be like this yeah okay now there are three possible scenarios gain is so small that minus one zero is very far away okay so that's scenario number one there's another scenario where minus one zero is inside there's another scenario where minus one zero is somewhere here these things are not drawn to scale but I think you get the idea 
Yeah. Okay. So there are these three scenarios that are possible, and let's look at each one of them with some degree of caution. So when Kc is very small, we know from the transfer function if you don't have enough proportional action, system would be unstable. So now you can see from the Nyquist plot, it is actually not encircling minus one zero scenario one. You are not encircling minus one zero, and yet the system is unstable. Why is that? It is so because. Oh well. Hmm. Okay, so what was the Nyquist theorem in full form? Number of clockwise encirclements is equal to number of zeros minus number of poles in the right half plane of G open loop. Yeah, and G open loop is over here. Okay. Okay, so now in scenario one, the number of encirclements of minus one zero is actually zero. Number of poles in the right half plane is actually one, corresponding to this chap. Therefore, number of zeros, which is the roots of the closed loop characteristic equation in the right half plane is actually is equal to 1. So, because you have one root of the closed loop characteristic equation in the right half plane, system is unstable. So, this is unstable. Let's look at this guy, scenario 2. In this case, we are getting uh, one clockwise encirclement. Hmm? Then here, garbled kar di. Maine lagta Ha ha ha! Sorry, sorry, sorry. The 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 way it is drawn is not correct. Yeah, yeah. So I know the mistake. The mistake is as follows. Clockwise, anti-clockwise. Okay. Yeah. Actually, it goes like this. See, you get minus pi, and when you make a positive contribution uh, at low frequencies because of this term, you'll actually go like this, and then come like this, and the complementary part. Is going to be like this, yeah. So, okay. So you are actually. So, ye directions garbled ho gayi hain. The directions have gotten messed up, but the shape is okay. So we are going like this, going like this, going like this, going like this. Arey yar. Okay, so we go like this, something like that. So in scenario two, you've got one anti-clockwise encirclement. Anti-clockwise encirclement means if I apply this equation again, for scenario one, this is what it means. For scenario two, what we have is one anti-clockwise encirclement should be equal to number of zeros minus one pole is already there and therefore number of zeros in the right half plane is actually equal to zero so this one is actually stable and if you look at uh, scenario three you got um, one clockwise encirclement so scenario three invocation of that number of encirclements equation is 
you got one clockwise encirclement this must be equal to number of zeros of the closed loop characteristic equation in the right half plane minus number of poles of g open loop in the right half plane and therefore number of zeros actually turns out to be 2 so that means there are two zeros in the right half plane so this is again unstable and if you um, correlate this with your understanding of uh, root locus you will see I've got s equal to minus 1 so that's the unstable pole and then I've got s equal to minus 10 so minus 1 and minus 10 there are two poles here so the root locus would look something like this there will be this asymptote and then this locus will start moving this way one will start moving that way you will get a break point somewhere locus will break out and then you will get into asymptotes yeah this is what the root locus looks like so when the gain is small you have scenario one and you got this one root in the right half plane the other two roots are in the left half plane as kc is increased you end up as kc is increased you end up in this part of the and now you got one root here one root somewhere here another root somewhere here so all three roots are in the left half plane that's scenario two keep increasing kc again 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 and then you get two roots moving into the right half plane and that's scenario three where you have two roots in the right half plane so everything is consistent the root locus the the Nyquist plot everything is consistent okay I think this has been a long enough lecture I'll end it here we'll continue uh, with the how to tune PID controllers uh, right now we've just looked at some very basic applications for P controllers only next class we'll take up PID controllers and uh, maybe we'll also do a little bit about sensitivity uh, and that will be that so thank you for your kind attention I think I'll end the class over here thank you and goodbye we'll keep these changes and I'll upload them and I'm supposed to stop the active presenter Oh, this one has been a long lecture, but that's okay. So, thank you again. Goodbye.